Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. It's a privilege to have the opportunity to speak uh, for this audience of practitioner, specialists, experts, academic. Uh, just a control, is the, so, uh, the tone okay? There is no echo and so? Fine. So, it's a great uh, pleasure that uh, receiving this prize, I had also the opportunity to organize a panel. And uh, in the great generosity of the symposium, I, can, I could just choose who I wanted to have on the panel, for which topic. And uh, this is the reason why today uh, we will have the opportunity for an hour and a half to speak about criminalization of drug use, drug possession, and even of the pro uh, production of, uh, of drugs, uh, mainly, uh, I would say, mainly the non-violent actors at the bottom of the criminal pyramid, because those are uh, in between the real responsible for the criminal activities and the users. May I just introduce with one example why and or how I discovered that criminalization is a very important issue when you deal with drugs from a point of view that was my point of view at the beginning, uh, coordinating narcotic law, but as a minister of uh, health. I became a member of the Swiss government at the peak of the AIDS epidemic in, in Switzerland. And I was pushed, prom measures were promoted, there was a very great activity from some groups to, to have poly, uh, the policy change and to have the help they needed. One of the groups, the most active one, was a group of uh, gay people, men having sex with men. They were very vocal. For instance, in a press conference, they said, I am a murderer because I didn't uh, give enough, with uh, enough speed the medicine they needed. But that was helpful because it pushed the whole procedure, which was a lengthy procedure, to be changed. It was a very active group. They knew a lot. They helped us a lot, a, a lot to, to design new policies. The second group that was also vocal and active was the group of the people uh, of the sex worker. They also knew a lot more than the politician about what they needed. And they could speak loudly about their need. There was one group I didn't hear at the beginning because this group was not able to articulate really in the public space because they were afraid to uh, speak about their problem. And that was a group of the uh, drug consumers. So the first experience I had with criminalization is that all what we needed to know didn't come to us because the people who had this uh, knowledge and, uh, this, uh, um, and expressed also this need were not able to speak loud. The second experience I did is when we began uh, to shift drug policy to public health, the difficulty to be sure that the people in need had access to the services we tried to build on because they were afraid on criminalization. So in these two examples, I would say, the link between criminalizing people and obstacles to an open policy that is uh, really helpful uh, was obvious. And so even if during my time in government, I was not able to propose and uh, uh, even more, not able to, to convince that decriminalization should be one of the very important elements of a coherent drug policy, 
uh, I continue now to uh, uh, be uh, an advocate of this uh, solution, and we will speak about that. So, in this sense, uh, in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, panel, there was a slide saying that there is no uh, inter conflict of interest. I can say there is a big conflict in interest in me organizing this uh, panel, because I am absolutely convinced that the very necessary step, step will be the decriminalization of consumption, of the preparatory act to uh, the consumption, and alternatives to punishment for the non-violent petty criminals of the chain. Now I want to invite the people who uh, made me the honor to accept to be a member of this panel. First of all, I want to invite on the stage Letizia Paoli. Letizia Paoli is full professor of criminology at the University of Leuven, Faculty of Law. A brief summary of her life and her career is like a repertoire of European beautiful cities and prestigious universities. Research institutes like uh, starting from Italy, Cambridge, Manchester, Freiburg in Br Brisgau, Gießen, Paris, Rotterdam, St. Andrew, and Tübingen. But there were also uh, awards given in the United States of America. The two most important, perhaps, is the Thorsten Selling and Sheldon Eleanor Gluck Award of the American Society of Criminology and the Distinguished Scholar Award of the International Association for the Study of Organized Crime. Her field of research is organized crime, illegal and semi-legal markets, and related control policy. Professor Pauli, I am very happy to have you on stage. The second uh, participant I invite to join me here is Pavel Behm. He studied medicine at the Charles University in Prague and specialized in psychiatry. He has devoted most of his medical career to drug abuse prevention and treatment. But Pavel Bem is also an important political actor in the Czech Republic, first in the Czechoslovakia and then in the Czech uh, Republic. Since uh, 98, he is one of these Czech politicians who built the democracy in his uh, country. He was uh, mayor of the beautiful city of Prague from 2002 to 2010, if I am right. And in 10, he was elected as a member of the parliament of the Czech Republic. But he served also as a national drug coordinator with the responsibility for the implementation of the overall drug strategy. He's a member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. He's an expert and a trainer, very often invited in, uh, mainly in uh, Eastern and Central Europe, but also in other countries. He shares his experience. Welcome, uh, Pavel Behm. And the third panelist is Dave Taylor, he is Professor of International Relations and Public Policy at Swansea University in the UK. Uh, he has uh, been uh, visiting faculty in universities in the US, Australia, Hungary, India, and Hong Kong. This is a little bit broader than uh, the experience you did, but uh, uh, you brought from all this country experience to the UK and to Europe. Your main uh, area of interest uh, is the international control regime and the UN uh, system. Uh, you were uh, founding director, or you are founding director of the Global Drug Policy Observatory in Swansea also founding secretary for some years of the International Society for the Study of Drug Policy. Currently, you are in the two editorial boards, the International Journal of Drug Policy and the International Journal of Human Rights and Drug Policy. 
You will begin this panel, and I'm very happy to give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, first of all, I think it's really important to say congratulations on the prize. I can think of a uh, few people who, who deserve it more, so hats off, chapeau, thank you. And also, thanks again for inviting me to be part of the panel today. It's a real honour and a privilege. So as Madam Dreyfus uh, alluded to, my main area of interest is the international drug control system, principally uh, the United Nations. And really what I'd like to do in my time here today is talk a little bit about the journey, if you like, of criminalization at the international level. Um, to begin with, though, I think it, it's, it's important to just outline a little bit about how complex this journey is and how it is often prone to oversimplification. And I'll begin with a quote. And in, in the quite brilliant uh, Drug Policy and the Public Good by um, Thomas Barber and colleagues, the authors quote the American journalist and essayist H.L. Mencken. For every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. And in the same way that this perspective, I think, is critical when we're seeking to better understand and develop policies dealing with the use of certain psychoactive substances, so it's applicable when seeking to, if you like, deconstruct the history of engagement with the punitive approach at the multinational level. Now, by this, I mean the international legal architecture and related obligations for the control of drugs from an international relations perspective, something that we can usefully call the global drug prohibition regime. And this was a term originated by an international relations scholar called Ethan Nadelman in 1990. And I think it's useful when we're thinking about this topic. So this is a system which, one way or another, nation states generally consider or are influenced by at some point in the policy-making process. Now, to be sure, as I mentioned a few seconds ago, the story is complex and prone to simplification. Yet, I'd argue it's possible to identify trends in the way that both sovereign states and international bureaucracies have engaged with the criminalization of drug use. Patterns that sometimes relate to improved understanding of not only the properties or relative harms of substances, but also of market interventions designed to control their non-medical and non-scientific use, including in connection to a range of intersections with human rights principles and norms. Now, a growing body of research, including that focusing on Asia and Mexico by scholars like James Windle and Isaac Campos, strengthened the idea that even before the beginnings of concerted efforts to develop the multilateral drug control structure, some states were, for varied reasons, implementing what Campos and Gutenberg have called local prohibitions and controls. So consequently, I think it's fair to say that although drugs have been widely available in entirely unregulated markets, they have also, over time, been subject to control ranging from the death penalty to taxation. And prior to the 20th century, however, no global patterns were discernible in governing the trade and use of psychoactive substances. But I think it's plausible to suggest that this began to change with agreement around what we might want to call a set of foundational treaties. So these were multilateral instruments entering into force between about 1912 and 1936. Nonetheless, although the negotiations for these conventions were replete with the term evil in connection with the perceived immorality of non-medical and non-scientific drug use, the system that they created was predominantly regulative rather than prohibitive in character. So at this point, the aim was to limit production and manufacture and prevent leakage of excess licit drugs into illicit channels. 
So national legislation within some states was influenced by these emerging transnational structures, but discretion remained at the national level. Now, often conceived of as a smooth historical arc, the transition from the foundational era to the UN system with which most states engage today can, I think, actually be seen as a watershed event. So while retaining many of the features of the predecessor treaties, including, and this is critical, including a focus on supply side issues, passage of the current bedrock of the UN system, that's the 1961 Single Convention on Drugs as amended by the 1972 Protocol. The passage of this treaty is really important because it represented a moment when the multilateral framework shifted away from regulation and introduced a more prohibitive ethos to the issue of drug control. And this, is, this idea is based on research by myself and my colleague Martin Gelsma, but also others including Leticia, some of Peter Reuter, and other scholars including Catherine Carstairs. So as with conventions relating to regimes across a range of issue areas, the single convention and its sister treaties in 1971 and 1988 are the natural product of political negotiation and compromise. And, and because of that, and this is the same with all international systems, because of that, they contain a certain degree of flexibility, or if we want to use the technical jargon, uh, wiggle room, in how they're interpreted by state parties. And there's also some attention given to alternatives to conviction and punishment. Nonetheless, when read together, a combination of the preamble, so the preamble of the treaty, which really unusually for a multilateral convention includes the term evil, and this, this is um, based on a lot of the research done by a colleague of mine at Swansea called Rick Lyons. It's very unusual in any multilateral treaties that the term evil is actually used within the final language. But if you look at the preamble and combine that with a number of articles within the convention itself, we can see a shift of the regime's normative focus and moves to establish what, might, what we might want to call a prohibitive expectancy amongst parties to the convention. And indeed, in seeking to act upon their concern for the health and welfare of mankind, so that's also terminology laid out in the preamble of the treaty, the international community engaged with the now familiar logic that efforts to shrink and ultimately eliminate the illicit market will solve what has become known, I think somewhat vaguely, as this thing called the world drug problem. So with this perspective came an increased emphasis on the criminalization of the individual drug user via sanctions on possession, with proponents believing that this would act as a deterrent to engagement with the illicit market. And that such a stance was enhanced in the 88 Trafficking Convention, strengthening of language regarding possession and requiring parties to adopt measures to establish possession as a criminal offence, crucially those subject to the constitutional principles and basic concepts of their legal systems. So, introduction of new legal obligations to criminalise the entire market chain beginning with cultivation and manufacture all the way through in some circumstances to possession for personal use, indicated how the regime, I think, had grown more restrictive over time. And within this environment, I think there's much to be said for Neil Boyster's uh, view. So Neil Boyster is a, is a criminal lawyer based in New Zealand. His view that the prohibitionist nature of international drug control has been accepted in a largely uncontested way since the endeavour fell under UN auspices. And paradoxically, despite the 1988 Convention's escape clause, such a process has contributed to the tightening of national drug laws, the introduction of harsher sentences for drug law offences, and this has led in many parts of the world to skyrocketing levels of incarceration. Now, as is well documented, emphasis on the law enforcement-oriented punitive approach has also resulted in a range of human rights abuses. Now, that said, though, I think it is important to finesse this connection with the multilateral framework. As research by um, Barrett and Novak 
point out, it isn't that the drug control conventions directly result in human rights abuses, but they can't be divorced from these and other violations as their influence on domestic drug control policy and legislation is considerable. And I think it's fair to say that a growing appreciation of the potential tensions between drug policy and human rights helps explain why increasing numbers of states in the last few decades have started to move away from criminalization as the dominant policy choice. Now this, along with realization of the ineffective, costly, and often counterproductive impact of the law enforcement dominated approach has led some states to engage in policies that can be seen as what I would call a soft defection from the authoritative norm at the core of the international regime. A process that has involved engagement with decriminalization of possession for personal use and a range of health oriented evidence based harm reduction interventions often resulting from local initiatives. Now, while varied and complex, such a trend might be regarded as a shift from the market elimination perspective to various forms of market management, options that are widely accepted to be permissible within the current treaty boundaries. That's not to say, though, that this has been a smooth transition. Some parts of the UN bureaucracy, notably the International Narcotics Control Board, and maybe to a lesser extent the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, have at various points over the years been hostile and demonstrated what I think we can identify as a form of systemic inertia. Meanwhile, what might be regarded as the status quo-oriented states within the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, the CND, that's the central policy-making body within the UN for drug control, some of these states have challenged such a shift in approach, claiming at various points that it puts the integrity of the entire international framework at risk. Yet the regime has shown a remarkable ability to absorb change, and I think quite honestly where it can't actually to give the impression that it's business as usual. And this can be seen in the changing perspective of UN bodies, and a significant example of this, and an indication of moves towards a more coherent and system-wide approach on drugs is the recent UN Chief Executive Board's unanimous endorsement of the decriminalization of people who use drugs. And I think this is enormously important. It's the agreement of 31 UN agencies of a common position on, on drugs. And although not as stark, it can be seen not only in CND resolutions, but also in what we might want to call soft law instruments, like the 2016 UNGAS outcome document. So that's the document coming for the United Nations General Assembly special session on drugs. And more recently, in Vienna, only in March, the 2019 ministerial declaration. So while within the debates within the CND, we still hear terms like evil and scourge, these documents talk of the importance of human rights. They talk about proportionality. They relate drug policy with the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the SDA, the Sustainable Development Agenda, excuse me. And they also um, acknowledge the need for, and I quote, an integrated, multidisciplinary, mutually reinforcing, balanced, scientific, evidence-based, and comprehensive approach. Now, this is all positive, but, there's always a but, isn't there? But we can see a vertical disconnect existing between the high-level language, including in relation to evidence-based policy and practice on the ground. And this is most obvious in relation to, again, what we might want to call the status quo states, a state, for example, like the Russian Federation, China, Japan, other states as well. But it can also be seen across a spectrum of nations. And all too often, a preoccupation with the reduction of the scale of and flows within the illicit drug market still, I think, distorts genuine efforts to reduce a range of harms, a dynamic influence to varying degrees by how we measure drug policy outcomes. So consequently, while changes in attitudes to criminalization at the international level have taken place, I think it's fair to conclude that the progress remains ongoing and is fluid 
and I'll finish on this point, is particularly fluid in relation to regulated cannabis markets, which is a whole other issue, but it is related, because these are policy choices that currently are deemed to lie outside the parameters of the extant regime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I invite now uh, Professor Paoli to share his, uh, the result of her research and her experience. Oh, yes, it does work. So, good afternoon, everybody. I would like, uh, first of all, to congratulate uh, Madame Dreyfus uh, on the prize. Now, it's a more informal setting than this morning, so I can do it. And also, I would like to thank you, Ruth, for inviting me uh, to join uh, uh, this panel. And um, I would like to warn you that there will be some overlap between the slides and what I will... What I, what I'm gonna say right now and what I said uh, this morning. I have an hour, I have some slides, so at least I can kind of back uh, my statements uh, with some data. And uh, um, indeed, my starting point is similar uh, to uh, Dave's uh, uh, starting point, to what just we heard. So the international drug control regime uh, started about uh, so more than 100 uh, years ago, uh, and throughout its history has focused on the supply of psychoactive substances that are not uh, entrenched in uh, Western habits. The first treaties, though, were not prohibitionist. Uh, on the contrary, they placed the emphasis on regulation. And it's only since the 1950s that the supply control, the control of the supply of psychoactive substances was equated with supply reductions. And a growing emphasis was placed uh, on uh, the criminal law interventions, as we see now in the current uh, three conventions. And the goal, uh, only especially since the uh, 1961 conventions, became then uh, reducing drug use by reducing drug availability, and, uh, and you could reduce drug availability by reducing drug supply, uh, and so drug production and drug trafficking. And even the EU still perpetuates the equation in its uh, European drug strategies between supply-oriented interventions and supply reduction. So the, at the, two, the, uh, the two are fused right now. And uh, although uh, I mean, most Western countries have now shifted towards multi-pronged drug policies. Uh, the criminal law measures still account for the bulk of drug policy expenditure. You see here that 13 out of 19 countries that have data on these EU countries that have data on drug policy expenditures devote more than 50% of their resources to enforcement and other supply side measures. And among these countries, there are big ones, huh, such as Germany, France, uh, the UK, and uh, and Italy. However, despite uh, the emphasis on supply reductions uh, in the international drug policy regime and also in EU policy and expenditures, the life on the streets, so to say, um, uh, speak, uh, plays out differently. So most criminal measures, even in the EU, end up uh, targeting cannabis and end up targeting cannabis users. If you just look at the two uh, columns in the middle, you see that out of about one million offences uh, that were registered uh, in 2017 in the EU, 80% of them were related to cannabis and 80% uh, of them, uh, uh, sorry, and 60% of them just focus on cannabis possession offences. And the two external graphs also clearly show that drug-related law enforcement activities against both possession and use offenses and uh, supply offenses keeps on growing. Cannabis also represents uh, the bulk of drug seizures within the EU, as it accounts nowadays for more than 70% of them. And so by all appearances, uh, despite the increasing calls uh, for policy reforms, and despite the policy reforms in a number of non-European countries, uh, cannabis is still front and central uh, in the portfolios of the European law enforcement agencies. And this would also mean uh, that if cannabis were decriminalized, considerable human and financial resources of law enforcement agencies could become available. Overall, uh, we see that there is a positive trend towards reducing imprisonment uh, for offenses related to drug use 
throughout uh, Europe. However, uh, we have still, even within Europe, a very broad spectrum of uh, options, especially uh, in Eastern uh, Europe, but also here huh, in Scandinavia, especially in Sweden, uh, even so the possession and even the use, huh, so in some places are criminalized, and uh, uh, some of these countries also foresee imprisonment sentences just for possession offenses. You have a number of countries that have the jure, huh, uh, uh, criminal offenses even for possession, but do not implement it, huh, such as Germany and the Netherlands. You have instead other countries, huh, such as Spain uh, or Luxembourg, that have entirely decriminalized drugs possession and interestingly, uh, small Luxembourg published uh, last, uh, uh, yeah, made public, announced last uh, December that they intend to legalize uh, recreational cannabis for residents. So it's going to be interesting to see how Luxembourg is going to deal, not so much and not just with the drug conventions, but especially with the EU drug, with the EU law, such as the Schengen Agreement that have incorporated uh, the uh, UN conventions into US, into EU law. There are also still big differences concerning the sentences for uh, uh, drug offenses, even drug trafficking offenses concerning the EU. You see here, for example, for one kilo of cannabis, you have a number of, com uh, of countries that have no uh, statutory minimum uh, uh, penalties, whereas there are some other countries in which, according to the law, even for one kilo of cannabis, you could get uh, uh, even up to 10 years of imprisonment. And the same picture is true also for other drugs. Uh, true, uh, we did a recent study on the shift of uh, drug trafficking within uh, Belgium and the Netherlands, uh, where there are considerable differences in terms of drug policies, and apparently the traffickers do not care very much uh, because the probability of getting caught, according to them, is very low. Um, but still, it's important to realize that these criminal interventions are incapable of uh, deterring use and cutting the supply, cutting the availability of drugs. You see here, for example, that in the past 10 years, the price of cannabis has slightly increased for the first time, but there has been a much higher increase of potency. And even the MCDDA, the EU Drugs Agency, notes uh, uh, just a few days ago in the, in the annual report that it published just a few days ago that the in that uh, all the indicators suggest that cocaine availability is an, an whole time high. Uh, just consider that in 2017, 104 tons of cocaine were seized in Europe, and this is uh, more than what is uh, um, being used in, uh, in Europe. So according to estimates, about 80 tons are used uh, yearly. So the law enforcement agencies already see more than double, and I think we uh, consider that these kind of increases in seizures as a success, but we hardly pause and think that I mean, then these drugs still need to be produced, huh? so that through our successes, seizures, uh, we really promote huh? so, uh, drug production in places like Colombia, and therefore further increasing the harms up there. Uh, there are also some changes in supply that further complicate uh, the criminal law interventions. First of all, the shift from cannabis resin, which uh, used uh, to be primarily imported to, in Morocco to domestically produce marijuana. And also, uh, so as you see now uh, from this first graph, marijuana now accounts for the majority of the seizures and the quantities seized within the EU. And also, uh, increasingly, uh, so these uh, natural uh, illegal drugs are being substituted with uh, unregulated, sometimes very powerful synthetic drugs, huh, such as cannab cannabinoids, but also very potent opioids, such as fentanyls. And alas, criminalization, our prohibitionist approach, is not just ineffective, but also harmful. Yeah, uh, that's also clear if you look at the upstream interventions, uh, such as uh, eradications, which are also mostly ineffective because of the balloon effects. Uh, so uh, just think of what's happening, for example, uh, uh, in Central uh, America. Uh, and Indeed, most of the supply-related harms, think of corruption, violence, and but also many of uh, uh, the use-related harms, so for example, uh, hepatitis C, are the results of our prohibitionist choices, are not inherent ha harms that are inherent uh, to the drugs themselves. So, so, and that's why there is what I call a paradox of the sup our supply-oriented policy. On the one hand, this policy seeks to improve the human conditions, but it can yield 
substantial harmful consequences, both, ha both intended and unintended. So what is, uh, what is the alternative? Shall we legalize everything? This is not what I'm pleading for. I think that certainly, as uh, uh, Ruth also suggests, I think that we should incrementally experiment and uh, regulate uh, uh, the psychoactive substances that are uh, currently legal study from cannabis, huh, which is the most widely drug, uh, used drugs and also the least harmful. However, I would also like to point out that criminal law will always remain uh, a necessary component even of a new regulatory framework. Because, for example, I have three kids and I wouldn't like to have them offered cannabis uh, or cocaine, or not even cannabis, uh, next to their school. So there's going to be, even in a regulatory framework, a place for criminal law. However, criminal law should be used much more sparingly. And its enforcement should no longer be seen as a goal per se, but rather should be seen as a means uh, to achieve a higher end. And therefore, a means that is subject to uh, evaluation. And given this uh, paradox, uh, Victoria Greenfield and, our, and I, a few years ago, uh, published uh, a paper which was called If Supplier-Rented Drug Policy is Broken, Can Harm Reduction Help Fix It? So we proposed uh, so, uh, to apply also this harm reduction approach uh, to the supply side and not just to the demand side. And um, as you see, our naive response was yes, so the less naive response was maybe. Indeed, once we started uh, reading the literature, we realized uh, so that there were uh, some major challenges uh, to be met. First of all, there is a problem of vocabulary. It's unclear in the literature what harm reduction is about. Is it a, a principle, an ideology, a policy, a set of interventions? For us, it's clearly a goal and an evaluation criteria. The second reason is politicization, um, which is crucial, particularly in the US, uh, but also in the UN circles. Uh, harm reduction is still uh, uh, a word that is uh, uh, considered quite problematic. From our perspective, the most serious problems have to do with the methodology. And I would like just to give you a hint of these problems. The decision to label something as a harm is normative. We define harms in terms of violation of legitimate interest, but what are the legitimate interests? And what are the legitimate claimants? For example, should we also include harms to criminals? We list the second set of challenges under the label of infinitude and causality. How far do you want to go in counting the ancillary effect of a specific harm? And the problem of causality is known in the literature as the problem of the remote harms. For example, are the harms of drug use a result of uh, drug trafficking or not? There are also problems of quantifications, as the relevant data are often not available. And concerns about data and measurements are not only technical, but also normative. As Albert Einstein aptly stated, not everything that counts can be counted. And last but not least, there are problems of incommensurability. Many different types of harms cannot be measured or compared by a common standards. There is no way to decide on the basis of science alone whether harms to individuals' integrity resulting from violence or from drug use are more or less serious than harms to, uh, uh, to, government, enforcement, to government integrity resulting from corruption. Victoria and I have developed a methodology which is called the uh, harm assessment framework to address some of these challenges, and we are quite transparent in saying that some challenges, such as incommensurability, cannot be fully addressed. As you see, the framework consists of a series of tools and, uh, um, and some steps. A key tool is the taxonomy. As you can see here, we list the possible bearers of harms and the, harm, uh, the interest dimensions that can be affected. We also have developed severity and incidence scales. For example, the severity scales go from catastrophic to marginal. Uh, and by mixing them up, uh, we have developed a prioritization matrix, which uh, offers a preliminary base for addressing uh, incommensurability. Through these scales, we are also open to using both qualitative and quantitative data. And uh, Victoria and I say that this harm assessment should be used to provide 
baseline estimates huh, for successful for policy evaluation. So through this harm assessment, you can see what are the harms right now under the current drug policy regime, and then you can use that to uh, try to assess the harms uh, under a different policy regime, and then compare uh, these net consequences, uh, so the benefits uh, understood in terms of avoidance of harm uh, with the implementation cost of each policy. And as I said uh, this morning, through this exercise, we could, also be, we could also be able to see in a systematic way which are the winners and the losers uh, of the uh, current drug control regime. So, to conclude, uh, I'm convinced that harm reduction as a criterion, as a goal, offers the advantages of breadth. Uh, it encourages an evaluation of policy across a broad spectrum of issues. It's not enough to, in order to say that an evaluation is successful, to say that it helps reduce drug use by, say, 10%. Uh, we have to consider uh, the broader outcome of a policy on income, on corruption, on violence, on environmental, on, env so on the environment and on uh, human health more uh, broadly. Um, I think that a harm reduction approach could do much in kind of de de making law enforcement no longer automatic, no longer our default uh, reaction to drugs. It might also help us uh, address drug supply more constructively. As I said this morning, it's quite possible to reduce total harm uh, uh, resulting from drug supply and drug dealing, even if drug use remains stable. And uh, a harm reduction approach might also help us anticipate better the unintended consequences of uh, uh, the new policy measures that we are, that some countries are interventions, and uh, hopefully help us address uh, the paradox of uh, the contemporary supply-oriented policy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Well, after the historical overview, after uh, your assessment about uh, the effect of criminalization, the practitioner in the double sense of a physician who has a strong contact with people using drugs and who was instrumental for reforming drug policy in his uh, country. Uh, the former mayor of Prague is looking for his slides and finding them, no? Hope I can do it. <laughs> Help is coming. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, first, uh, congratulations for the award. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, Madam Dreyfus asked me to be as short as possible, uh, and I will try to do so even though I'm well aware of the fact that to be too simplistic might be a little bit misguiding, so please, apology for that. Uh, Czech Republic uh, and the narrative of uh, the 30 years of drug policy design and implementation uh, since the Velvet Revolution in 1989 is obviously referred as one of the so-called successful drug policies or drug policies which works. I'm a little bit hesitating to accept this because I'm personally involved in the process of implementing the policy since early 90s. And I know personally very well that many of the events that happened happened accidentally, not in a systematical, systematic way of design and implementation and evaluation of the drug policy. So maybe we were just happy, but who knows. If I put it in a very simple words, there are five aspects why the Czech drug policy works. First of all, decriminalization. Second, needle exchange schemes and public health angle as well as the human rights angle was extremely important from uh, 1989. Third, outreach and low threshold services introduced broadly throughout the country. 
opioid substitution treatment for those uh, users uh, addicted or uh, using uh, opioids. And fifth, financial sustainability and evidence-based angle. If we start with the decriminalization, I have to say that 1989 and the first vote of Václav Havel as a president also meant his strong involvement, personal involvement in human rights area. And he was the one who was strongly arguing that all imaginable target groups of human beings have and should have the right for liberty. So there was no stigma that time. And in fact, in 1990, the recodification of penal code in the former Czechoslovakia meant that the possession for personal use and also the production for the personal use was not labeled as a criminal offense. So in fact, probably the former Czechoslovakia was the first uh, country in Europe which really decriminalized uh, the use of uh, illicit substances. However, it was not so easy, because certainly the time was going and the politics was growing, and in 1998, after the uh, parliamentary election, the uh, strong group of uh, parliamentaries, basically representing the former com or the Communist Party, but also Christian Democrats, started the public advocacy for recriminalization, and they were successful. So in 1998, the possession of illicit substances and also use of them became again a criminal act. We immediately started with so-called impact analysis project of new drug legislation, which was very sophisticated research agenda of uh, five major studies, 26 sub-studies, supervised by the School of Crim Criminology and Criminal Justice at Florida State University and uh, wonderful uh, gentlemen and researchers, Bruce Bullington and David Rasmussen. And uh, we insisted that the impact analysis project, looking and assessing the change of the legislation will be granted from the national funds, from the National Drug Commission funds, and uh, in three years brought outcomes. And it was clear that there was zero positive effects on prevalence of use, but there were extra costs per arrest, the estimates was uh, 30,000 crowns, that means it's like 1,000 euros. So, that was the beginning of a long-term process. It took us 10 years, and at the end of these 10 years, in 2008, we were able to submit to the Parliament and get through the second Decriminalization Act, and uh, that happened in 2006, uh, 2008. My perspective backwards is that uh, it was crucially important not only to do that, but to involve the process of uh, scientific evidence proving that the expected outcomes of these so-called hardliners and advocates of so-called drug war did not meet the reality. The second aspect of the effective uh, drug policy in my country probably was uh, Needlands Rich Exchange program spread throughout the country. At the beginning in 1993, we distributed 150,000 needles and syringes. 25 years later, we distributed uh, last year 6.5 million. It's still not enough, because if you look at the 50,000 person who inject drugs and are at risk, and very often they are addicted to heroin or other opioids and amphetamines, we calculate that they 
need 35 or 36 million of injection sets. And we distribute approximately one-fifth of that. But still, somehow, it sounds <laughs> that it's enough. The third aspect of the effectiveness is probably the outreach. In 1990, we have three specialized uh, interventional treatment programs for persons who inject drugs. In 2017-108, low threshold and outreach services, which met quite, uh, for me at least, astonishing figure, 1993, 20% of uh, drug injectors were in contact with healthcare facilities or helping facilities. 2018, almost 80%. So we, in fact, are in touch with most of persons who use or inject drugs in the Czech Republic. So we can just communicate with them. We can help them. We can just hear them, what they need, etc. Substitution. Uh, was uh, one of uh, major topics in the morning, so I am not going to uh, take more time on that, but it's an important uh, segment of uh, the Czech drug uh, policy. Financial sustainability is something that is probably very special for countries of former Eastern or Central and Eastern Europe, and maybe also Southern e e Europe, uh, because during the transition, uh, a lot of things are happening and changing, and the, the funds are important for so many public agenda that drugs are very obviously at the bottom line. So we knew that we have, if we spend some money, we have to spend them in uh, the most effective way, and just to provide and buy and provide the syringes and needles is extremely cheap. So we did it. At the end, we calculate that harm reduction investment is one euro per capita per year, what is uh, not too much, but in fact it represents 50% of all the money spent on the Czech drug policy. So 50% of the public spending, spendings on the drug policy field goes to harm reduction. So, at the end, after these 30 years, the results are following. Uh, very low HIV seroprevalence among persons who inject drugs. Very low HCV prevalence or reduced HCV prevalence, significantly reduced. Reduced hidden population of those using substances and injecting drugs. Uh, very low mortality rate, one of the lowest uh, in uh, Europe, very low morbidity rate, and uh, in simple words, reduce, reducing not only of the public health risks, but uh, the overall social and economic costs. These figures show that uh, the overdoses in the Czech Republic is uh, compared to other 28 European countries uh, in quite promising part of the graph. The same is true for HIV seroprevalence, as I already said. When I ask myself what was the vehicle for paradigm change, I think the first thing was the understanding of best practices. And this morning, uh, we heard the lecture of Ambrose Uchtenhagen. He was the one actually provided the, us as uh, very young and not really experienced experts in the field, provided us with support and uh, with some sort of a guidance. But not only Swiss uh, experts and Ambrose Uchtenhagen himself, but also the Netherlands experts and UK experts uh, later just became our friends, and all these social networking were extremely important. The same is true for evidence-based approach. So not only uh, Florida State University School of Criminology, Criminal Justice provided us with the inevitable support, uh, methodological support, how to run the cost-benefit analysis, in fact, for three years, just uh, counting what are the benefits or just uh, costs of the new recriminalization uh, drug legislation. 
So uh, UK uh, experts, uh, Jerry Stimson, Robert Power, was were just with, with us that time or so. Economic driven policy I have already mentioned and decriminalization as a, as a key, in, more probably uh, than the, the penal aspect also, the philosophical aspect was important because we spent just 20 years in our country, in my country, talking about decriminalization or criminalization. Uh, very strong argument of hardliners for penalizing, criminalizing, criminalizing the possession and uh, uh, use of illicit substances was that if we don't do that, the cannabis prevalence use will be just growing and growing in the Czech Republic. Well, we don't know. Uh, it's hard to say because of the, again, decriminalization, the cannabis prevalence, you, you, the cannabis use dropped out. But th this is the reality. So two years later, or three years later, after the decriminalization, these figures we see. We, we are well aware of the fact that the drug policy itself does not explicitly affect the drug field and drug consumption just in the time of introducing of the new drug strategy. The opposite is true. The, <laughs> the drug context and drug situation in each country is just directly uh, affecting the drug policy field. This is true. We are not sure about the other one, but we know that in the long run, it brings the effects. So, from early, the beginning of 90s, we had in mind these so-called unintended negative consequences. We learned about the unintended consequences from many countries around the globe, where the misguided drug policies brought enormous cost. And one of my conclusion points is that uh, sometimes, the misguided drug policies are the etiological moment of all the tragedies and costs and harms which are which are we confronted with. So as Kofi Annan said historically criminal record is much bigger threat to individual as well as to society than occasional use of drugs. So, my conclusion is that even though the Czech Republic uh, is referred as the so-called successful drug policy, well, uh, I like this picture. I spent some time at Papua New Guinea Island with these Damal people. Uh, this is, the picture is not old, but it's a couple of uh, years back. So. As a person who are in touch on a daily basis with those using drugs, I know that all the time I act in an absolutely simplistic way with a lot of stigma in my head. This is, for example, a needle, so-called needle, we found in the Czech prison last year. It's from the pen. Can you imagine how the so-called needle with the uh, rest of the ink, because this was originally pan, was just uh, injected into your veins. It's just crazy. For me, as a for medical doctor, it's really crazy. But so even in the Czech Republic, we do not have uh, needle exchange schemes in prison. We have limited uh, number or percentage of opioid users with accessibility to uh, uh, opioid substitution treatment approximately ma at maximum 50%, and the, the rest 50% are just still waiting for. Last month, uh, we adopted a new drug policy uh, document for the next uh, new white paper for the next seven years. It's interesting that we were successful in formulating the one of two goals which says regulation of drug markets. So we will try to regulate in the Czech Republic drug markets. 
<laughs> next seven years. The other aspect of the new drug policy is an integrated context, alcohol, tobacco, illicit substances, gambling, and technical games. The Czech Republic has two million addicted persons to tobacco, 500,000 to alcohol, 200,000 gamblers, and 50,000 illicit drug uh, users. So, tobacco and alcohol, number two and number five, global burden to so-called control policies we are talking about. So, we are looking forward, <laughs> and we don't know what will happen in the uh, next 30 years, but we hope we will be successful. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we can take some minutes to I interact here on, on the stage if you have uh, questions to raise um, or remarks to, to do. And we will open the discussion to the uh, audience. There are microphones here. I don't know who can distribute them. Thank you, lady. Uh, but first of all, do you want to continue and to react to some of the speeches that were made? Well, I Letitia? would like, if I can, I would like to uh, ask a question to Dave. Namely, I would like to um, ask him to give us a kind of a, a forecast of, uh, uh, yeah, of. Uh, the, if, I mean, what will happen, uh, in your view, if you had to make a bet, uh, uh, develop a, a scenario with uh, the UN conventions? Uh, do you see possibility to reform them, or rather that uh, some countries will just, I mean, uh, start ignoring them and, or getting out of the conventions? So what kind of scenarios do you foresee? It's always nice to start with an easy question. <laughs> so I think it was the, the uh, physicist Niels Bohr who said prediction is always difficult, particularly about the future. So thank you for throwing me that one. Oh. So um, I, I alluded in, in my presentation to, 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 the, to the fact that the international regime, and as you, as you said as well, is, is, is old, it's very well established, there's a lot of inertia at the international level, there's a complex relationship between how the UN system intersects and interacts with the national level. And you can see, I think you can see these, these, these patterns of change and movement, certainly. And the reason why I think it was important to highlight the change within the regime around the 1950s, 1960s, is to highlight the fact that change can, can happen. So that I think that it's important to start within, within that respect. And in terms of looking forward, I guess we can break it, again, simplistically, at the risk of oversimplifying, in, into a, into a couple of different scenarios which, which do intersect and they do, do affect each other. So if we're talking predominantly here about decriminalization, for pers um, possession for personal use, and a range of harm reduction interventions, so predominantly I'd be talking here about harm reduction interventions relating to injecting drug use, so needle exchange programs, op opioid substitution therapy, we heard about HAT earlier, and so on and so forth. I think you, you can see a movement with, with the international system, and as I uh, alluded to, there's, there's been a, a, maybe not a paradigm shift, but a shift in attitudes at the state level and at the system level. So I would predict, although that is risky, I would predict that that trend would continue amongst certain states. Because the, the issue is here, and we're talking very much particularly at this session about evidence-based policy. And over the years, the evidence has increased, not just in terms of the properties of, of drugs themselves, but also evidence around specific interventions engaged to stop people using certain drugs. So the evidence base has increased, and some countries will engage with the evidence base. But as we know across a range of public policy issues, sometimes evidence doesn't matter. And I don't think Peter Reut is in the room here, but he's written a very good article about why evidence doesn't tend to, tend to have a great deal of traction within, within drug policy, and there's lots of different reasons there. So I think, without deviating too much on the question, that we're going to get that trend, and evidence will increase its influence in, at, at certain levels in certain, at certain states. And again, talking about complexity, you've got to realize as well that there's a very, very 
um, fine-grained mosaic of policies because, again, I mentioned that some policies start from the bottom up and this can start at a municipal level. They can then, uh, as it happened in the US, although the politics are different there in terms of cannabis, start with um, political processes. At the sub-national level, you sometimes get nation uh, national shifts and you sometimes get regional shifts. So you can get all, all these moving with evidence coming alongside and as I mentioned as well at the UN systems level, the bureaucracy as well moving towards sort of an evidence-based and rights-based um, policy position. And I think it's important as well to notice the rhetoric over the years has included more and more to do with human rights, so you get that intersection. So that's good. Now, on the flip side, some states, it doesn't matter. It's still, it's still dogmatic, it's still based on ideology. These are the states that within Vienna you still hear every year talking about the evil of drug use, the scourge of drug use and drug use and so on and so forth, and the language of a drug-free world, which was very prominent in 1998 at the UN level, less so now, but you still hear that language. So I think you're going to get kind of a, a bifurcated shift ahead in terms of decrim and um, harm reduction. Now, the interesting question, which I just sort of threw a little hand grenade out there at the end in terms of cannabis and regulated cannabis markets, I think that's a real, a real issue. Because we are seeing a trend now, and again, it's complex. Some of it's to do with human rights, some of it's to do with health, some of it's to do with organized crime, but a certain number of states shifting to a form of market management that goes beyond decrim. So as you're all probably aware in the room, I mentioned the US, so you've got lots of states. I think there's now 11 states in the US and Washington DC. Um, around 2012, we had Uruguay, and then more recently last year, and hugely significantly, Canada moved towards regulated markets. I think within the next couple of years, you mentioned in your slides Luxembourg, which is gonna be very interesting at the EU, European level, as well as the <laughs> international level. Um, but also there's discussions within Mexico, which would be Next. Hugely significant in terms of geop geopolitical terms, and there's discussions going on in New Zealand. So you've got Canada and New Zealand, these are hardly pariahs in terms of the international system. So how that plays out will be interesting, because there's um, a consensus amongst most lawyers that you can't move towards regulated markets within the current system. So what I can see, I think rather than a wholesale uh, reform of the UN system as it stands, maybe the development of, of, of a parallel system that just speaks specifically to cannabis, whereby states like Canada, like Uruguay, like New Zealand, Luxembourg, Mexico, can adhere to the overarching goals of the conventions in terms of health and, and well-being of, of mankind and adhere to many aspects of the, of the system as it exists, but run parallel with regard to cannabis. That would be my very rough prediction within that field. Thank you, David. Thank you. Well, I think uh, we have 20 minutes uh, to speak with the audience, and uh, I just would ask you to uh, say who you are and from where you are coming. Questions, remarks, please. Thank you, <coughs> Hendrik Tam, Stockholm University. Uh, the main argument for the strict uh, drug policy of Sweden is the low level of recreational use and number of young people who ever tried. It's an argument that comes from the temperance movement and the te stepping stone theory or the gateway theory. You represent here a number, the expertise of Europe. What is your experience of the relationship between temporary use of cannabis and detrimental use, like real heavy drug abuse or drug-related death in your country over time or comparing European countries? Well, thank you for, for this question. I think we have really to, to make a difference between decriminalization and regulation of, of markets because, uh, as Dave said, one is absolutely possible in the frame of the convention. It's a matter on one kind of interpretation, but it's also the matter of national law. 
a national law on decriminalization will not be against the commitment taken into the uh, convention if it is uh, uh, based on the general uh, law principle of the country. Uh, regulation is beyond the convention, and I think the, the fear of a, a large impact on uh, consumption is more to see in relation with regulation than with decriminalization. But the question is still, is uh, the criminalization a deterrent for consumption? We can uh, put your question in this, uh, in this form. And there is no evidence that uh, uh, it is really the case. Uh, if you compare different countries, for instance in Europe, you see that uh, more uh, <coughs> criminalizing countries have higher level of consumption than countries like the Czech Republic, I don't know, you can uh, give the figures, but Portugal, for instance, has uh, lo the lowest or one of the lowest level of consumption having uh, introduced uh, decriminalization uh, De, de facto, and, but not only decriminalization, but also uh, support given to the people uh, who are invited to tell about their problem and their needs uh, in, a so, uh, in front of so uh, dissuasion commission, as it is uh, called in, uh, in Portugal. So there is no evidence if you compare the different uh, countries. I think there is no real evidence if you compare in time uh, introducing uh, drug uh, decriminalization of the consumption and possession is not really uh, something where we can say this was the beginning of an increase of, uh, of consumption. Uh, now, this is for consumption and the preparation of the individual uh, consumption. I would say the problem is more difficult to find really the alternatives to punishment for the uh, petty criminals in the, in the chain because often the, there is a, a wish to criminalize the visible presence of the drug trade, uh, that is the dealer in the street. But the dealer in the street is somebody that can be replaced the day after uh, he has been arrested. Uh, he cannot be in uh, normal countries, I would say, having a, a, a balanced and proportionate system. They cannot be condemned for a very long time for a small amount of uh, selling drugs. So that this uh, low level is, I would say, quite untouchable by criminalization. So we have to find alternatives. It's not easy. In many countries, the people who are uh, at this uh, level are people who are marginalized in society, often without possibility of other jobs. I think, for, for instance, of uh, illegal migrant uh, population, uh, which uh, finds uh, the only living in such kind of, uh, of activities, so that the uh, Problems will be generally not on the criminalization side, but uh, to be solved on immigration law and uh, job uh, offering and uh, skill of people who have uh, a low uh, level of skilling and so on. I can add also that some of the dealers are consumers so that uh, uh, they, they can be punished uh, even in country where uh, the consumption is not uh, criminalized because they are also selling to have the means for their own uh, consumption. So uh, it was a long answer to a very short and important question. Uh, there is absolute no evidence that, that decriminalization would increase and there are some indices that the contrary might be the, fi uh, the, the f uh, fact if it is w well done. My colleagues, your experience, Pavel, in the Czech Republic, the only country in Europe that really decriminalized in the law? As far as I know, actually, in the last 10 years, in um, several European countries, there were cases of uh, 
increasing penalties for uh, related to uh, cannabis use and possession as well as decreasing. And if we look at the results and outcomes of that, it's extremely colorful. So all scenarios are possible. Uh, so it sounds uh, like uh, it's so country specific. Uh, for example, in the Czech Republic, the availability of cannabis is uh, growing, the supply side. Well, uh, the consumption and the prevalence of use is slowly decreasing. <laughs> And uh, it's very likely it does not have too much uh, to do with uh, the decriminalization or recriminalization, but it, it much more con systemic and complex uh, aspects of the uh, current reality in my country. Uh, but I personally, <laughs> as a politician and a drug expert, and as a, as a person uh, who, who knows the quite well, the, knows the, the cultural aspects of the, the Ch Czech people, I don't think that even if uh, the uh, cannabis market would open and uh, legal, legalized, uh, or let's say, in, a, in a better words, uh, market controlled way, not for everybody certainly, and under certain circumstances, just taking care of minors, etc. Uh, I don't think it will just bring uh, any disaster. <laughs> Leticia, you want to add something? No, I think you two have given a good answer. Yes, please, Dave. The, um, w thank you for your question. Um, w you use the term the gateway theory. And I, th I think that's interesting because there's, there's a lot of discussion about the gateway theory and what the gateway theory is and whether it's a sort of realistic and evidence-based sort of approach and way of looking at it. And I think, I think it's, it's important to sort of look at that as a concept and look at the evidence base around the gateway theory. As I understand it, there's two ways you can see it. You can see the gateway theory as a way of explaining how the use of a certain drug then leads on to another drug, the implicit assumption being that you move from what we might want to call soft drugs to hard drugs. I'm not sure the evidence based on that is particularly robust, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and secondly, another way of looking at the gateway theory is to understand it in a way that engagement with the criminal market then allows an individual to change their behavior within that market and then again not only mix with with certain people drug dealers at whatever levels but then also then have access to so-called harder drugs on on that i think it's interesting to look at the dutch example i mean the dutch example is very complicated because mm -hmm. it kind of sits somewhere in the middle in terms of the coffee shop and prosecutorial discretion but effectively what the coffee shop system did was it separated markets because it meant that someone who wanted to use cannabis could buy it from a coffee shop and wouldn't have to engage with a drug dealer who was selling all sorts of other drugs. And the evidence that I've seen, I think, suggests that that's been very successful because it's set, it has separated the markets so the people who are using cannabis aren't using drugs like heroin, for example. And the data suggests, I think, that, that I've seen, I admit I haven't seen it for a long time, but if you look at the age cohorts, the, the, drug, the heroin drug users or problematic drug users in the Netherlands are far older than in other parts of Europe suggesting that there's sort of slower initiation of drug use and then in fact the separation of the, of the markets does seem to work. So I think it's interesting how we view this thing called the gateway theory and actually what the evidence base says about that. Thank you. Next question, remark. Thank you. I'm Carl Erling Haldin. I work as a judge in Sweden, and I don't understand this matter because we are now uh, criminalizing uh, tobacco smoking. You're not allowed to smoke. And I think the question is, is it healthy to smoke tobacco, uh, then criminalize it? Is it healthy? to smoke cannabis, legalize it, but if it's not healthy, 
Of course, we should criminalize it. And the question is how to uh, manage with the criminalization, not to give up. And I don't like this uh, song from Peter Tosh, legalize it. Thank you. I didn't understand didn't. everything. Uh, I didn't entirely. I think it was if, if tobacco is harmful. Well, I have a little bit difficulty to, to understand your, your remark. Uh, is it a remark? Is it a question? But it is still about the coexistence of two kinds of I, markets. I, I, I can uh, uh, precise it uh, or, or make it more difficult because if I go to uh, the healthy institution and I want a medicine, they can give me a medicine that's healthy. But how can you get the, this um, medical institution to give me drugs that's not healthy? I don't understand that. Mm. Okay, I think Pavel will answer. I think when we look, you said alcohol use as well as the tobacco use is harmful, right? And you are right to a certain extent, because uh, it very much depends also on the amount and severity, and et cetera. It's not so, <coughs> so easy. However, at least in my country, we do not put alcohol users and tobacco smokers to jail. Yeah. So the argument that something is harmful, some behavior is harmful, is not argument that the intervention is incarceration. And this is, this is one of the key messages the Global Commission is sending for the last seven years uh, to the world outside. Because uh, as, I, as actually Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General said, and member of our distinguished member of our Global Commission, he said that the criminal record is just a lifetime penalty and it's much bigger harm, not only to the individual, but also to the society, compared to the occasional or recreational or even addictive use of any substance. So we have to look at uh, what are the costs and consequences of uh, policy intervention, and this is uh, evidence-based, clearly wrong, up, wrong. Thank you. We have uh, six minutes more, so that is probably just one question or remark. The lady in the middle. Thank you for an uh, interesting seminar. Um, my, my question is, um, from a policing point of view, the argument often is through criminalizing the use or uh, the abuse of drugs, it is easier to come to the um, how do you say, the, the real problem of organized crime? So it, it's, it's more a question of surveillance, maybe, than on... Um, how, how would you argue against that, or for, for that matter? Leticia? Yes, I'm happy to answer that. So, and I think that, uh, uh, well, I can imagine that in some occasions, so, uh, it might be handy for the police to get uh, some information uh, from the users and you can um, uh, put more easily the user under pressure if you uh, can uh, I mean, threaten them with, uh, with an arrest. But I think, uh, I mean, there has to be a proportionality, first of all, in the means that you use. And, so, and, uh, um, and I think anyhow, the information that users can tell about these organized crime levels, and so uh, uh, this information is very limited eh, because they have no idea. At most, they can just tell you where they bought the drug from. Eh? But uh, as repeatedly has been said here, even the, the low-level drug dealers 
uh, are, are, first of all, are themselves often users, huh? so deal just because they need the money huh, to pay f to fund their own addictions. And even if they're not users themselves, are very marginalized people who are themselves rather victims huh? so of uh, uh, the illegal drug distribution uh, system rather than uh, really main uh, participants huh? so, and uh, responsible huh? for, uh, for the harms of drug supply. So I think that even uh, next to uh, consideration of effectiveness, uh, there, there has to be also, there, have to, there must be also consideration about appropriateness. Uh, so what is appropriate, what is, uh, I think we are all committed also to kind of proportional uh, sentencing, uh, so that the sentence has to be proportional to the harm caused. And what is the harm caused by drug users uh, so who just uh, possess a small, a small quantity of drugs for personal use? They cause no harm to others. And therefore, in, from my point of view, uh, there is no uh, legal, first of all, there is no moral, but also no legal justification uh, for criminalizing them. And also, even if uh, we think that uh, I mean, this, uh, drug use should not be encouraged. I think there are more effective ways than criminal laws huh, to try to discourage that use. Thank you. That is, uh, I think, a wonder wonderful uh, uh, conclusion. There is really the moral question to know what is the right for the state to punish people for a consumption they freely choose. Uh, and. Uh, what is the sense also of a division between uh, substances that are legal and substances that are listed as unlegal. I would like to give you on the way uh, something that is very important to understand if you speak about drug use, and that is that the large majority of people consuming drugs are not addicts and control absolutely their consumption. As uh, many of you control the consumption of beer or wine, uh, using it only in a moderate way, the same is uh, true for cannabis, it's true even for cocaine, uh, it's true for some substances, for other less, because the level of uh, addict, addiction, potential ad addiction can be uh, higher. But the large majority, uh, uh, an estimate from, uh, from Vienna, from the UN, is I think that 11% of the people become generally seen are becoming really addicts. So the first category doesn't harm to nobody, not to itself and not to the others. The second category are, uh, have a chronic disease and this chronic disease cannot be punished, uh, but uh, cured Th and cared. Thank you for your attention and a good symposium for all of you.